Hi, how's it going? This is Resident of Collinwood for YouTube, and I'm here to continue my read along of the Dark Shadows Daybook, written by Patrick Mc McRae. Um, artwork done by Wallace McBride. I am episode 364, guys. That's where I'm at. When the ghost of Sarah appears to Barnabas at last, will her spectral message haunt him long after she vanishes? Barnabas, Jonathan Frick. Sarah's haunting of Collinwood intensifies. She finally appears to Barnabas, excoriating him for his lethal lack of ec ethics, and when then appearing at the estate proper to warn off the wrath of the dead. Julia confronts the family with her assertion that Sarah is real. Meanwhile, while the bodies in the plane were burned beyond recognition, Elizabeth seems convinced that Burke is among them in the crashed plane in Brazil. Victoria is completely unwilling to let him go. Dark Shadows is a program with far more halves than should be mathematically possible before and after Barnabas is the most notable that comes to mind. But there's that there's before and after Vicky's exit, before and after the introduction of time travel, before and after color. This is intensely organic in a show about transformation and our relationship with the past. In trans Kaylee in Trinscaly, each of our major characters is on the other end of extraordinary transitions. When we meet them, future and past are always an intense dance on the program. Inevitably, the present is threatened by impending justice or exposure for the choices of yesterday. This episode is an intense knock nexus of all of the above. The installment begins with only two episodes before 1795, a wild ratings gamble. There was a chance they might not come back, so Team Curtis had an enormous challenge ahead. First with one character, near immortal, and another robbed of the future. They so profoundly desired it. It feels organic. When the program returns, and when a program returns from the past, it will be with a new purpose and main character. 1795 is the transition, and it will elementally ch challenge both future and past protagonists. Though the lens of death, one has been reborn, but as a mor moral toddler, literally deserving of a child's Sensor, his growth is ahead, but who was he before he began life for the second or third time? Who is this the man he needs to be recaptured? And if he is, as is hinted, a good man fallen, what change is still necessary so that his return is to more than square one? The other will die in the gallows. Her past is a mystery, and now she finds herself back so far. Her own origin is irrelevant, and maybe it always was. Vicky defines herself by giving Burke was not really a match in that sense, other than his comfort with talking. The fact that Vicky witnesses his 
history is ultimately irrelevant. It has very little impact on modern events. Given her knowledge, it could snip months of plot with just a few lines of dialogue. Vicky's future past purpose is to bring out the hero in our analog. Peter Bradford, the one person willing to give of himself on the level at which Vicky excels, both meet, both give, both die as a result. Both are reborn in the present. Both leave whatever identities they had have or will have to pursue happiness. Pre presumably away from the gods. Peter away from the context of what could be. Victoria away from the context of what was. Each was the prisoner of the intangible part of their lives and together they find the Zen imperative to live in the present even if the present is in the past. But we know Vicky and Barnabas, they've been exhaustively established. How do we prepare them and ourselves to begin a journey that seems well underway? In two successive scenes, each deals with profound loss. The naturing figure is defined by the loss of her romantic prospect, a dazzling virile man who affirmed her womanhood rather than proto matronless just before the brooding bachelor is defined by a loss of a child and more importantly her moral benediction it's one thing to discipline an adult <clears throat> it's our daily job to discover the new lies, faults, betrayals, and inadequacies of those who suffer around us. Barnabas, meeting with Sarah, linked to his past, and the ultimate in innocence is humility, humility many times over. He's last in line. He's shunned in front of Dr. Hoffman. He's denied love. His moral fallings are cited via nursery rhyme by the child to whom he taught it. Just then he thinks he can comfort himself with the reality of being struck with, stuck with someone just as pretty as he is. Julia rises above it, learning thankfully only by example about the price of falling from your own moral standards. She rises above it her immediate instinct to offer compassion without jealousy nor agenda. The only hope for Barnabas is Sarah's stern warning that he must learn to be good again, which of course means that he has the potential, which of course means that he has the future. Now, with an evolved Julia waiting for him on the other end of the flashback, he is ready to start the business of finding that future, and in the most important sense, Dark Shadows is ready to begin. I'll check that out, guys. Check out that artwork. That is so cool. You guys see? Check that out. That is awesome. 1795. Barnabas begins. A seance corn, corn ports the Collins governess back to 1795, where she will be tied for, or sorry, tried for witchcraft. Meanwhile, a jealous witch disrupts young Barnabas. Plans for marriage, leading to the curse that transforms him into a vampire. Episode 384 When Barnabas demands satisfaction from Jeremiah, he gets it. But which man will shoot first? Barnabas, Jonathan Frit. Everyone at Collinwood attempts to talk Barnabas out of the duel, 
with his uncle, but he refuses to back down. Knowing that death is certain, Angelique equips Barnabas with a special charm to wear in the duel. Barnabas kills his uncle and Josette swears enmity to her former lover. Dark Shadows does one thing better than anything else. Smash assumptions. For many writers, crafting dialogue for the 1790s flavor would be burdened that would take them away from relevance. For, Sa for Sam Hall, it releases him to or sorry, depict sharp, eloquent men and women facing difficulty, difficult truths, and their educated and aware eyes open and informed. Charlton Heston once said that you understand what Shakespeare was saying, there was no way to say it, rather than muddy things up. The right language clarified. Or sorry, Shakespeare was saying that. The right language clarifies. No matter how many contractions are denied, yes, some actors struggle with a bit. But, I'm sorry, not every. I'm sorry, not everyone can be Gwyneth Paltrow and believable play believably play characters far smarter than they are. But then you have Jonathan Frid and David Ford. And you see actors at ultimate ease with the show at last. Just as Heston was born to wear a toga, Frid was born for breeches and neck cloths. in that air and grab and guard. Barnabas at last has a simple direct honest honesty rather than gain affections. It's as if he lo loses them and finally gets to tell the truth. There is such clarity and elegance in his performance here. It's both beautiful and sad because we finally see one of Canada's finest actors and at full gallop. Had he not chosen early retirement, he had he been paired with a powerful agent, to me, Jonathan Frid would have landed parts that demonstrated cross sections of William Holden, Albert Finney, and Hal Holbrook. I agree with that. Like Grayson Hall, there is a vaguely silly quality that he accidentally displays when snarling and shouting and freighting over gremlins and ghouls. You try it and see how well you do. But here, working in seamless tandem with the marvelous Laura Parker, you see such easy confidence. Fred finally gets to do what eludes so many actors. He speaks simple, hard truths that are changing that character's life against all better judgment. This duel is a terrible idea, but I really accept that he believes he has no choice. That's far tougher to authentically sell than the hunger to drink blood. To see this sad, strangely self-assert acknowledgement that yes, he's going to duel, and no, he's never been in one, and no, Angelique, he's never even seen one. There you have it, because this is the life we live, and what other option have I? In this one episode, we understand Barnabas on a deeper level than we ever have before. He makes really terrible decisions, utterly rationally, and I guess, in his case, I might do the same thing. This is revealed in both his scene with Laura Parker and his scene with George. He owns up to his self-pity with open eyes. Laura Parker's Angelique experiences a strange horror. 
Two, it's a sorcerer's apprentice moment. He'd rather fight for a woman who will never have him than be with anyone else. Whose fault is that? Oh, and it will probably kill him. Great. Angelique has such humanity here. He was just a... It was just a scheme gone away at the end of the day. Has she triggered a death wish in lieu of the love she believed she was conjuring? And does this suggest that her seeming hate for others was really self-hatred? Back to Frid. Is his heartbreak over losing Josette? or over losing Jeremiah. Love comes and goes, but friendships, I argue, can be much deeper. When Barnabas concludes that his uncle hated him all along, I think we see the central loss, betrayal, and heartbreak that not only leads to his greatest mistake, but powers the engine of pain that pushes him through all of his subsequent relationships. In his fealty, of, fealty to Julia and Quentin, an attempt at penance, or is it a simple statement that he will never put someone else through that kind of betrayal that he experienced? If Angelique had known any of this, I think she would would have had Josette run off with the stable boy. She does love the guy, after all. It's Anthony George last episode. I've read that George was uncomfortable with the parts he played on Dark Shadows and pushing Burke to become a normative, normative presence is a bit time to make the donuts for an actor. I can sense a shade of relief and freedom in his turn here. He's moving on. Episode 392. There goes the neighborhood for Joshua when Barnabas announces he's gone. Accounts for an island girl. Will, I walk, will a walking corpse wake, walk her down the aisle? Joshua Collins, Lewis Edmonds. Barnabas visits Josetta at Jeremiah's grave. Tortured by his reasons for marrying her, quiet insight remains as placed and piercing as ever. Later, Joshua bristles at the news of the wedding and insists they move into Comalwood at once, seeking to disrupt what may be rekindling feelings between Barnabas and Josette. Angelique resurrects Jeremiah. What a sad, painted, mature little gem of an episode. Everyone tries to make the best of it until there's nothing left to do, but reanimate the corpse of a beloved relative shot by another beloved relative. We've all been there. This is 1795 at its best, focusing on critical depictions of the characters in conversations that define not only where they've come from, but where they are, and where they are destined to go. But not just them, these are moments that define the future of the Collinses. As well, everyone needs to be applauded for their acting in these ones, because the humanity they show really reveals the truths of their contradictions, and the contradictions of their truths, none more so than Joshua. It's easy to carry Naomi's flag. She gets to be one of the handful of strong-willed women in a time when such things were rare, and very proud. We are all of them in that era. It's only a handful because any more is a waste. Joan Bennett excels at taking Humbridge in the name of decency and punctuation it with ultimatums. 
The writers clearly knew this was her strength because when she got to do anything else and made the papers from her to Unlang Goom, Naomi is a voice of aristocratic uncommon sense until she, you know, kills herself, largely to make another point. Pretty much that it's wildly depressing to see your own son bite his cousin after Labor Day. Barnabas' mother always was a bit extreme. Meanwhile, Joshua continues to reveal himself to be perhaps the saddest character among the profoundly gloomy Gus's of 1795. Okay, maybe he's not as sad as Barnabas. When he shoots his uncle or sees Josette jump to her death, because of the inhuman monster he's become, or like the, that one time when he begs his own father to execute him, or when he kills those prostitutes before he even gets to a receipt for a tax. <laughs> I like that. That's true, too. I don't think he walks away from those tragic moments with his sums pooping his suspenders and whistling turkey in the straw, buying the local orphans a round of decories at the Eagle. Historians would argue that this act this is actually because Turkey in the Straw had not yet been written by Frederick. Chopin, Chopin, and the disagrees wouldn't exist before the Spanish-American War. Truth be told, historians would argue anyway just to kill time while they're waiting for more history to happen. And I guess Vicky's frown was maybe hard to turn upside down when a noose was placed around her neck for crimes she never committed. And she finally suspected that Peter Bradford was no Dan Fielding. Of course, Dan was a prosecutor, so laws of nature prevent him from defending witches. And what's the point of Marky po Post if she's not dressed like Elector women? He's a fictional character for me even further in the future, so he's no help anyway. Why was she thinking of him? Does her frown matter? She had a bag over her head. And here's why Joshua is the a formant gloomy Gus. Edmonds absolutely nails the performance. Yes, sir. Of an, incre of an incredibly fearful and tender man forced by his heir to adopt completely regrettably, everything he does is to fortify the Collins' name. And it's clear that no one, not even he, can live up to that standard they've brought into. Was it for business? Was it to keep the locals from seeing the man behind the curtain and ransacking the place? Was it because he abruptly believed in the highest standards and was going to craft the illusion until the rest of, of life caught up with him? Pessimist, idealist, yes, to all. He even built a gargantuan mansion when he already had a gargantuan mansion. And f for a family of five, it is ultimately conspicuous consumption. Hardly an old world sensibility. Correction. Joshua is an old world bulwark, forced to both exaggerate what he delivers for the bold frontier and maintain English dignity to the end. He both believes it and doubts it to the end. The result is not is nothing but death and dissolution dissolution. There isn't so much a vampire soap opera. This is a 
This is Arthur Miller every day at 4.30. The episode is an embarrassment of riches elsewhere. Angelique has the talk with Naomi and Joshua about love and class mobility. And you can see Joshua caught between his sense of social propriety and his firm belief in the opportunities of America. Laura Parker navigates between the caste structure and optimistic common sense in a way that's neither obscurious nor arrogant. We see a great woman here, and it underlines the exasperating our circumstances that took that wise greatness and fused it with the evil of desperation. She didn't need to turn out this way a few hundred years, and yet only 45 years hence she won't. Equally winning is Josette. The scene in the graveyard with Barnabas is a master class by Catherine Lee Scott in portraying that strange, quiet wisdom. It only comes from total decimation. Josette is a character we are so often told was most adored. Often she's just a bit of a porcelain doll, but not here. Here we get it. Here we see the controlled, intelligent, intelligent woman for whom it could be argued Colin was ultimately built. It's a Solomon slow burn, and it's one of our first glimpses of why Barnabas will risk everything for her again and again. The Society of 1795 made these characters inhuman long before a curse did. In episode 392, we see the humanity that has struggled and will continue to struggle within. Episode 405, when Barnabas decides to take up arms against his new wife. Are his troubles over, or are they just beginning? Bat, Bill Baird. Barnabas arranges for Josette to be moved to a remote location where he will ta later join her. When Angelique discovers this, she goes predictably ape and tortures Sarah via voodoo doll to prove that she will still wears the pointy hat in the family. Barnabas has had all he can stand and can't stands no more and just shoots her. It's a fatal shot, but it leaves her enough time to curse him, with words that will later curse even her. Anyone who loves him will die. As with Bruce Wayne, a bat swims into, into inevitably and bites Barnabas on the neck. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Barnabas Collins is the Inspector Clouseau of Dark Shadows Universe. And I mean that in a high compliment. In true punctuality style, he mixes abject hand bringing fear with a bravado that no interest in reality when he smirks, it's almost inevitably a sign that he's in for a fall. I said almost because of this his moments of victory have the indescribable sweetness of the astoundingly rare. In episode 405, however, there is no victory. Only the worst defeat of his life. We can rely, rely on Gordon Russell to deliver a script of nimble power play between Barnabas and Angelique. Jonathan Frit plays the build-up as if he were wisely navigating between Noel Coward, Coward and Edward Alby. His medlow sw sw swagness with Angelique is the perfect and satisfying retort to months of extortion and abuse. Barnabas finally has the one by the tail. For a moment, unfortunately, he's still no great shakes as a duelist. 
and has never heard of a headshot. That's true. That's true. He's no Solomon Kane, though. <laughs> I love that. He's, he's really not. I mean, he's not the best shot with a pistol. That is proven. Barnabas is not a great shot. But come to think of it, Poison would have done the trick. Fritz downplayed heightness, pretends to fall to come beautiful. He rarely seems this confident, and the same can be said for Barnabas. No real line trouble, either. High jinks and expiration are senseless bores to memorize. Characters in vital action have easy lines to remember. The other hero of the episode is Laura Parker, who crafts such a playful menace that she might be a reincarnated cat. It's the only explanation for her complex approach to mixing fury and sadistic fun. The real hero of the beach, however, is Bill Bard. The guy swings a mean bat. He gets Frid on the neck with an uncanny precision. A noted puppeteer, Bill had a ripe career in his field. He was an author of a steamy tale all the art of the puppet, and he was honored in 1980 by the Union International Della Marnetti and Puppeteers of America at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. On this day in 1968, Jacques Cousteau gave television its most celebrated semen. With the airing of the first special, Mickey Dillon celebrated this by having his wife give birth to their daughter, Amy, on the very same day. Episode 411. As Barnabas returns from death, he learns that his resurrection comes at a price he can never repay. Barnabas, Jonathan Fred. Barnabas awakens to find Angelique covering over him with a stake. When he discovers that her curse rendered him neither alive nor dead, he kills her. As Barnabas discovers what he has become, Ben Stokes volunteers to help him, and while hiding Angelique's body, must bluff Barnabas, curious father, Barnabas returns, having found that his new life demands the blood of others. Guys, I want to show you something. Check out that. That is awesome. That is an awesome depiction of Laura Parker. Angelique herself. That is amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Before I read this. That is amazing. This is it. I mean it. <laughs> there are those episodes that wind up on top ten lists. Huge turning points. But because of the strange structure of soap operas, the episodes of action sometimes differ from the more interesting moments of actual consequence. So, which do you pick? When looking at the whole reason, you go to 1795, which is the front row seat for Barnabas. Begins. When, hit, when is the moment? It's usually pegged at four epi as episode 405, the episode in which Barnabas shoots Angelique. She lays the curse, and he answers the door when the bat knocks. Yes, vital, critical. All of that is true. However, it comes at the end of the episode, ripping the plate from us just as we're watching for the spork. Then we have five whole episodes as he tries to escape his curse and finally dies. Distancing itch and scratch to a point that the dramatic impact is muffled. Are they necessary? Yes. For the development of Angelique's rather sustained consequence. Or sorry, conscience. Arguably, the time gap heightens attention and creates more and more insensitive to keep watching. 
and more, they might have lost me by reaching episode 411 is so deeply satisfying. The non-stop action and development make consequential viewing. This episode for me is 1795 as its very best and one of the reasons that flashbacks is so profoundly remembered. Few things are better than, than good. Dark shadows But this is so tight and intense that it ventures into the same realm as City on the Edge of Forever, coloring outside the lines of its own show standards to become not just an example of the program at its best, but the medium at its best as well. Not to say that an episode has to be something beyond Dark Shadows to do that, it's just it just has to be Dark Shadows at its best. A core sample of why we care. This is it. And we care because we care about Barnabas. And we care about Barnabas because we care about Jonathan Frid. What Jonathan, or sorry, what Jonathan Frid brings to the writing. And how that alchemizes with the work of Laura Parker, Maggie, and Josette create frustration for Barnabas and we feel for them both. Angelique brings threat, conflict, and desire on metaphysically moral, mortal, and immortal levels. Maggie and Josette may test his greatness, but it is the transformation brought on by Angelique that makes him great in episode 411. He realizes what he has become. Fred musters his full Shakespearean experience here, finding the truth in the moment's seat size. Barnabas surges with the panic and awe and oh that come with standing outside of life and outside of death. It's so appropriate that the, they avoid the word, the word vampire at this point because the moment of the realization feels bigger than just becoming a folktale turned penny dreadful, baddie. By n not using the V word, we focus on more cosmic status of Barnabas and his al alienation from both of the sides of existence, not alive, not dead, just indifferent, imbued with the passionate difference to everything sacred in the nature order, he even comes, or sorry, he even overcomes it only for a moment. All of Angelique's powers, guys. I want to show this off one uh, one more time before I turn the page. Look at that. That is beautiful work. Beautiful. Absolutely. real quick there's some more artwork guys check out that check out that artwork for a read that is beautiful work you guys see the, the skeleton and the net that is beautiful artwork by wallace great job i love it she's not only a witch she's also dr frankenstein desperately trying to undo her own creation and the only thing that can undo her angelique's powers stem from nature, even in natures of the dark afterlife. By creating someone who stands outside of both life and what dark destiny lies beyond its gateway, she has an open eye moment. Barnabas demands to know why she was trying to destroy him before he rose. Yes, good question. And the answers are so mirrored that the moment power powerful dramatic choice resides in not addressing them all because how can she as Barnabas sinks into this sad and terrified realization that his unwanted and Nets Nets state will require the loss of love lives 
he experiences the unique sadness of wanting the impossible end to an existence beyond what we can imagine fear drove Barnabas in life and fear drives him after his dance with fear is an intense as his pursuit of love and leads him into the paradox that drives him and the series just as love pushes him to do the hateful fear will push him to be brave we see this in his reflector Ben Stokes recognizes his humanity as Barnabas loses his and who quietly and hopelessly finds an impossible hope as his master drifts from what it means to be human. Ben instinctively musters newfound will and compassion to help him, and by helping him he creates essential humanity for both of them. Ben stands at the opposite pole of Angelique's of, or sorry, of Angelique, and somehow also shares a love for Barnabas that makes no sense, yet never reigns as false. No, it doesn't. If Barnabas has to have his humanity ripped away to eventually find Ben Stokes, is his unwitting guide for that journey as he himself goes for murder, murderer to conservator of life. As, he fi as a final paradox, Ben can only become the guardian of life by allowing the master in his charge to subsist on the lives of others. Does Ben do this of the social focus to, that define the proletariat and working class? Put your pants on, Spartacus. He does it because of the fr Faustin spawn we call friendship, impossible friendship. What, but what friendship worth is grit, isn't it? Isn't it? Lives will be lost. There is no account for that, literally. But the ultimate story of the show is how Barnabas pays a debt. That he can never afford. That's a kind of pursuit with which everyone can identify, but might never admit. What is life? Why do we love? And how do we justify being here? Through the best and worst exploration, both life and death, Barnabas searching alongside us. Okay, guys, that's where I'm going to stop. I want to show you I'm going to be on 416. I want to show this one more time. This death that is be that is a beautiful artwork i love the laura parker one too i'm on episode page 65 episode 416 when i come back tomorrow night i want to thank um you guys for tuning in link obviously will be in the description box of where you can pick up this bad boy um writer patrick mcbray artist wallace mcbride uh I'm blown away so far. This is really good. Guys, if you have not picked this up, go pick it up. I'm going to continue my read along tomorrow night. I have another video to do. I hope you guys are enjoying these. I want to give a huge thank you to Patrick McCray for joining me last night. It was a lot of fun. Um, I'd love to have him on again. I'd love to bring Wallace on and talk about his artwork. It's amazing. Thank you all so much for joining me tonight. I'll see you. I have another video to do, but see ya.